I was a 38-year-old college professor, and I taught art, and I had taken a group of students and my wife, and we had gone around Europe, and we had just done a three-week tour, and this was the next to the last day. And we were in Paris, and at 11 o'clock in the morning, I had um, a perforation of my stomach. When this happened, the pain was the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life, and it just dropped me right down to the ground. And so I'm twisting and kicking and moaning and screaming and yelling around on the floor. And my wife called an emergency, called the desk, and they called an emergency service. A doctor came and he called an ambulance because he knew what was wrong. And they took me about eight miles across town to the public hospital, to the general hospital of Paris, where I was taken into emergency examined by two more doctors who knew exactly what was wrong with me and then they took me away to the surgery hospital which was a couple of blocks away and I was parked there because there wasn't any surgeon available to do the surgery and so there I lay for um, eight to ten hours in that hospital with no medication no examination no attention whatsoever awaiting a surgeon to come to give me this operation that was critical. And it's now 8.30 at night. A nurse came in and said that they were very sorry they weren't able to get a doctor for me and they'd get one the next day. Well, when she said that, I knew that it was over for me. I knew that I was dead. The only thing that was keeping me alive was I didn't want to die. I was scared to death of dying because as far as I knew, I was an atheist, non-believer, person who lived for their, the gratification they could get out of the moment. And you know, like dying to me was like the worst. I mean, next to the pain, dying was the worst thing that could happen to you because it was the end of life and there was no more. There wasn't anything else. But when she said that, the idea of trying to exist for another minute, another hour, in this pain, it wasn't worth it anymore. I'd been hanging on in the hopes that they told me that they'd get a doctor and do the surgery and open me up and, and fix the problem inside of me, but when they said they couldn't get one. So I said to my wife, it's time for us to say goodbye because I'm going to die now. And she got up and she put her arms around me and mine on the bed and she told me how much she loved me and I told her how much I loved her and this makes me really sad. And um, we made our goodbyes, you know, said those things that you'd say to the, we'd been married 20 years, say all those kinds of things. I can't tell you because I'll just start crying, but um, she finally sat down because she knew it was over. And I knew. And it was just so hard looking at her crying like that. And I just closed, closed my eyes just let it go. And I went unconscious. I probably was unconscious for a very short while, a few minutes probably. And I was conscious again. And I looked, opened my eyes and looked, and I was standing up next to my bed. And I knew exactly where I was and what the situation was. I mean, there was no confusion in my mind. I felt um, more alive, more real than I've ever felt in my life. You know, people ask me, you know, were you a ghost? I was the op I was just the opposite. Very alive. As I'm looking around the room, I see that there's underneath the sheet on the bed, there's something under the sheet, a body. And so I bent over the bed, the head was turned away from me, and I looked at the face, and it looked like me. But that wasn't possible because I was standing there, I'm alive, I'm great, you know. I mean, I'm more than great. I'm like, you know. And so I tried to talk to my wife. Can't you hear me? And Can't you hear me? You know, she couldn't hear me or That's see me. That's not me. But I thought What's going on that she here? just was ignoring me. So I got very angry at her for ignoring me, for not paying attention to me. And I'm screaming and yelling at her, "What's going on here? Why why is this body in the bed that looks like me and how to get there and stuff like that?" I had a sneaking suspicion that the body in the bed was me, but I didn't want to think about that because that was too scary. 
So I'm getting really agitated and upset because this is all too weird. You know, this can't be happening. It's impossible. And I've got a hospital gown on, and it's like really, everything's really real. And I hear people calling me outside the room, and they're saying to me in soft, gentle voices, Howard, you got to come with us now. Come quickly. Come out here. So I go over to the doorway of the room, and there's people out in the hallway, and they're, um, uh, the hallway's dank. It's gray. It's not, it's not light or dark. It's just gray. And they're all in grayness, and they're men and women. And what they're wearing might possibly be hospital uniforms. Um, and I asked them if they were from the doctor to take me to the operation. And I told them, I said, I'm really sick and I'm going to have an operation and I'm going to die if I don't get this operation. And I was supposed to have the operation eight hours ago. And I'm telling them all this stuff. And they're going, well, you know, we know, we know, we understand. Come quickly, you know, come come quickly. Howard. Howard, come Howard, come, Howard, come out here. Howard, come quickly come with us. Howard, we've been waiting for you. Waiting. I Wait. left the room, which was real, clear, bright, and went into the hallway, which was dank and hazy, and um, followed these people. We had a very long journey. There's no, there's no time, and whenever I make a reference to time, <laughs> It's just an illusion because there was no time in this place. But this journey, if I were to recreate it, I'd have to walk like from Nashville to Louisville or something to, to recreate the, the walk with these people. And as we walked, they stayed around me and kept moving me on, and it kept getting darker and darker. Um, they were becoming more and more openly hostile to me. First, they were sort of syrupy sweet to get me to go with them and then when I was going along with them it was like hurry up keep moving you know shut up stop asking you know they started getting more um, ugly and so we get into complete darkness and I'm absolutely terrified because these people are very hostile I don't know where I am I said I'm not going to go with you any further they said um, you're almost there and we started to fight. I, just, I was trying to get away from them. They were pushing and pulling at me. And um, there are now a lot of them. What originally had been like a handful now was, since it was darkness, open, made hundreds or thousands. I, don't, I mean, I have no idea. And they're playing with me. You know, clearly they could have just destroyed me if they wanted to. They didn't want to destroy me. What they wanted to do was they wanted to inflict pain on me because they derived, pleasure isn't the right word, but they derived, derived satisfaction out of the pain that I experienced. So what they were doing in the beginning part was, it's real hard for me to talk about and I don't, and I'm not going to tell you much about it, just a little bit, because um, it gets, I mean, just gets too ugly. Uh, but the, initially they were like tearing and biting, um, tearing with their fingernails, scratching, gouging, ripping, and then uh, biting. And trying to defend myself, trying to fight them off, trying to get away from them, but this it's like being um, in a beehive. Just hundreds of them all over me. And I eventually was just laying on the ground there, all ripped up, um, pain everywhere, inside, outside. And even harder to bear than the physical pain was the emotional pain of what had just happened to me, the utter degradation that I just experienced. You know, I never once felt that it was um, unjust or wrong. I heard my voice. It wasn't somebody else's voice. It wasn't the voice of God or anything. It was my voice. And I heard it speak, but I didn't speak it. So whether it's the voice of my conscience or... I don't know what it was. It was just... But I distinctly heard my voice say, pray to God. And so I thought to myself, I don't believe in God pray to God when I'm thinking. 
even if I could pray, I don't know how to pray anymore. I haven't prayed. And at that time, I probably hadn't prayed in 22, 23 years. So, and so I'm thinking, like, when, when, when I was a child, and we said prayers in Sunday school, and we said prayers in church, and what did we say? And I'm trying to think of the, I'm trying to think of it because the, to me, to pray was to recite something that I'd learned. That's what, it, that's what I thought a prayer was then. So I'm, let's say, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, give us this day our daily bread. My country, tis of thee. No, that's not a prayer. That's wrong. Um, let's see. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers. And I'm getting all mixed up. I can't remember how to pray. And then the people who are around me, if I, every time I'd like mention God, these people who had attacked me and beaten me, every time I mentioned God, it was as if mentioning God was throwing boiling water on them. They would shriek, they would scream, they would yell, and in worse profanity than, than anything I've ever heard in this world. The other thing that was happening was that they, they um, couldn't bear to be around me talking about God. It was so it was so painful for them to hear about God that they kept backing away, backing away, backing away. And so I had a sense that I could push them away by talking about God. And so I'm trying to remember prayers and I'm getting all confused and mixed up and it was just all um, crazy and I'm lying there and eventually I realized that they're gone and I'm alone. Now I was alone there for an eternity. And what I mean by that was, um, absolutely no sense of time to, but I thought about my life thought about what I'd done and what I hadn't done I thought about the situation that I was in and this the conclusion that I came to was is that I had lived an entirely my adult life I had lived a selfish life my only God in my adult life was myself I realized that I was um, you know, something terribly, terribly wrong with my life and that the people that attacked me were the same kind of people that I was. They were not me monsters, they weren't demons. They were people who had missed it. The, p the point of being born and being alive in this world. They'd missed it and they'd lived lives of selfishness and cruelty. And now we're in a world where there was nothing else. The, nothing but selfishness and cruelty and they were doomed to inflict that upon each other and upon themselves uh, probably forever and ever and ever and ever without end um, and now I was a part of it and it seemed like although I didn't want to be there it seemed like probably the right place for me to be there was a sense of like this is what I deserve, because this is what I lived. You can't imagine how emotionally painful that was. And I'm lying there for time without end, thinking about my fate. And in the back of my mind comes up an image of myself as a child, sitting in a Sunday school classroom, singing, Jesus loves me. I could hear in my mind, Jesus loves me, la la la, Jesus loves me, la la. And as I recalled myself singing it and heard my, I could hear myself as a child singing it. More important than anything else was that I could feel it in my heart that there was a time in my life when I was young and innocent, when I believed in something good, when I believed in something other than myself, when I believed in someone who was all good, all powerful, who really, really cared about me. And I knew that I wanted that back, that which I had lost, that I'd thrown away, that I'd betrayed. I, want, I wanted that back. That I didn't know Jesus, but I wanted to know Jesus. I didn't know his love, but I wanted to know his love. I didn't, I didn't know if he was real, but I wanted him to be real. You know, I mean, it was, it was all just 
because I trusted that there was a time in my life that I had believed in something and that um, I knew I had known once as a child that it was true and I wanted to trust that it was true so I called out Jesus. into the darkness Jesus please save me please save me and he came he came first there was a tiny little speck of light in the darkness and very rapidly got bright and the light became so bright that um, if it were in this world it would have it would have consumed me it, it, it just would have fried me to a crisp but it wasn't at all hot or dangerous there the light just came upon me and he reached down he was in this light and he reached down out of this light and gently started to pick me up and in his light I could see that I was gore and filth and wounds all over and I, was, I looked like roadkill and he's gently putting his hands underneath me and, and very tenderly picking me up and as he's touching me everything just goes away all the wounds all the pain all the dirt just and it just kind of like um, evaporated away and I'm like whole and healed and inside uh, just filled with his love which I wish I could be more articulate about it's so frustrating not being able to tell people about it because you know it's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life I mean it's it's like the it's the everything you know it's the all of, of life is to know that love and you know I get to it and I just can't describe it I can't convey it to you so he's holding me and embracing me rubbing my back like a father would his son like a mother would her daughter just gently rubbing my back and I'm bawling like a baby out of happiness I mean like the the, the release the, you know having been lost and now been found having been dead and now brought back to life you know and he's carrying me out of there up we just go out go on and we're moving towards a world of light and um, I began to have thoughts of tremendous shame that I've been so bad so I'm I thought of myself as dirt garbage filth and I thought to myself he's made a mistake I don't belong here he doesn't want me you know it's like the shame of like how could he how could he care about me you know why me um, I'm bad and we stopped we weren't in hell we weren't in heaven we were in between and we stopped and he said we don't make mistakes you belong here and we began to converse and he was talking and telling me things and he brought over some angels and we went over my life from beginning to end and what they wanted to show me in my life was what I had done right and what I had done wrong and without going through my whole life story it was real simple real simple when I had been a loving kind person considerate of other people it made the angels happy it made Jesus happy and they let me know that it made God happy and when I had um, been selfish and manipulative it made the angels unhappy it made Jesus unhappy and they let me know that it made God unhappy um, what they were trying to convey to me in a nutshell was my whole purpose of my existence had been to love God love my neighbor as myself that's why I had been created that's what I was in this world to um, do, <coughs> to do and to learn and I had failed they told me that I had to come back to this world and 
I got real upset because I wanted to go to heaven. What they told me about heaven, it's like the most fun, most interesting. I mean, it's the most wonderful place. You, I mean, everybody, every, everybody would want, you know, want to go to heaven, and I wanted to get there. And they said that I wasn't ready, I wasn't fit, that it wasn't my time to go to heaven. It was my time to come back to this world and try and live the way that God wanted me to live, the way God had created me to live in the first place. I told them, Jesus and the angels, that I couldn't live in this world without them. And I said that I would have, my heart would break to send me back to this world. Because they were, they'd be there and I'd be here. And they said to me, Do you, you don't get it? You don't get it? What is the matter? We were trying to, we were showing you all this, we were explaining to you. We've always been there. We're all, we always have been there. We've always been with you all this time. And don't, you've never been alone down there. And I said, you've got to, you've got to let me know that you're around once in a while. So they said, if I prayed and confessed my sins to God, and gave, gave what I had, and, and they meant, what they meant by what I had was gave my worries, my cares, my hopes, my dreams, just gave it all up to God. That there would be times when they would be there and I would know in my heart that they were there. I wouldn't necessarily see them or hear them, but I would, I would, I would feel the love like I'd felt it then. And I said, if you will assure me that there are times when I can know that love, I could live in this world. And I said that they would do that, and with that they sent me back. After the experience, the uh, nurse who had been in the room a few minutes before and said they couldn't find a doctor, and they tried to get one the next time, she came running back to the room and she said a doctor has arrived at the hospital, which was like, this is all pretty miraculous stuff, because this is now like um, 9.30 at night, around 9, 9.30 at night. So the doctor's arrived at the hospital and we're going to have, um, do surgery on you right away. And some orderlies and people came in and they threw my wife out of the room. Um, and it was very disturbing because I was trying to tell them and I wanted to tell my wife what had happened to me. So when um, I passed my wife in the hall on the gurney on the way to the surgery, um, I said, everything's going to be great. And she just started bawling because she thought like that was like a dying man, you know. <laughs> you know? The strange thing about the experience is the memory hasn't dulled at all. It's real intense, um, and I don't know, it stays intense. And I believe that one of the reasons that God gave me this experience so that I would have an opportunity to share it with someone, I don't know who, I never know who, but I would have the opportunity to share it with somebody so that it could be of help to them.